and it computed. Okay, so that that's taken care of. Um, and uh, I'm gonna drop that down. Okay, so you see that? No, you don't. <laughs> Can you see that? Uh, you're not sharing yet, Dale. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay, well, we will get there. Um, All right, let's end the show. Um, here we are. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share. So put that on your calendar. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, I'm gonna try to get uh, the Clovis uh, recent Clovis discovery for our uh, spring meeting. Um, but as I was saying, I always think that's courageous, but she went ahead and she has found underwater sites that show these oldest of fish wares. Okay, some good news. <laughs> Can you see that? <laughs> I've got a new granddaughter. Uh, Manami is uh, just about four weeks old now. And her uh, her sister uh, Lilico is quite involved with her, so uh, just had to share that good news. And I've seen her twice so far in four weeks. But uh, the other good news is uh, Ed Carrier uh, uh, got this national award from the First Peoples Fund. You can see Ed here. Uh, and uh, being blanketed. Gosh, I don't really think this is set up to move. It's just very sensitive. But here's Ed back in July being nationally recognized with four other native uh, uh, individuals, including uh, Sean here, who's from Spokane. So two of the winners were from uh, Washington. And we should hear by the end of the month, he's nominated for the National Endowment uh, <clears throat> for the arts. Uh, and so hopefully he'll uh, get that National Heritage Fellowship in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's kind of a harder uh, nomination to be successful in just because it's all cultural communities and all arts, whether it's singing, dancing, musician. But hopefully he gets one of these gold medallions. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing this. And uh, do we have everybody in? That's because we don't have uh, uh, Matt with us. But um, let's see, I need to. So when I talk, am I full screen? Oh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm the host. There's Dave Bunsell. Am I full screen now? No. Hmm. We can make you full screen. <laughs> but you, everybody else is coming in full screen. I hope you know that uh, the Seahawks are playing and losing. The host? No, no, thanks. What's that? And anyhow, I wish I was full screen. I wanted to show you. Well, you, you are if people set it to speaker, which oh, I had done. Okay, so set it to speaker. Can you all do that up in the corner here in view? But I think I should just come in full, full screen here. But, there you are. Uh, oh, the rest of you do. Uh, anyway. <laughs> 
I, uh, on, on working with uh, these seeds and nuts, I do, do want to point out that the seeds are often very small. Uh, and I rendered a couple of salal berry seeds uh, and I had to use a French press screen. Uh, you never capture these in a typical archaeological screen of an eighth inch. Can you see it? Probably not. You probably see it in this. Uh, no, I can see it. It's right in the middle. Let me let me do one thing. Maybe you're, if you're I go Dale, there. you're you're Dale, you're moving it too much. If you just hold it in one place, we can see it. <laughs> All right, I'll be very. I'm kind of you know I'm real nervous here. See, can yeah, you that's, see? That's see better. It? They're minute. They're the size of a sand grain. Yeah, they're pretty small. It would, Dale, it would help if you spotlighted my, uh, yourself. On my finger, you might be able to see one, but it's just real. See it there? <laughs> real small. Um, there's, <laughs> and there's a hundred of them in each area. Hey, everybody mute your thing so I don't hear you laughing here. So, but of course, the, the nuts are much bigger. And uh, this one happens to have uh, started to germinate. And that's what you want them to do. Uh, crack open before you leach them and make them, uh, you know, get the tannic acid out so that they uh, are sweet. Um, <clears throat> that's certainly not preferred uh, non-Indian foods. Uh, we usually see acorns uh, as something that uh, uh, squirrels eat, <laughs> and I got, uh, and I don't think, you know, I don't, I, are you seeing what I'm showing? Yes. Well, this is my wife's uh, anniversary card. And of course, we see these uh, squirrels eating acorns, and my new granddaughter, I have a, a, a stuffed animal, and I, I kind of tend to get things that are acorn, but it's usually animals eating these. So it's not thought of as uh, human foods. It has been uh, recently in the ethnobotanical literature has been uh, uh, greatly expanded. Um, and uh, 2005, this, this volume uh, with several chapters on the use of plant foods ethnographically. Uh, of that, uh, 10 of them are talking about salal berries, zero on acorns, just absolutely zero. Nothing mentioned about acorns or oak. But Nancy Turner, who uh, is the premier ethnobotanist in the area, came out with two volumes, 1,001 pages on uh, all the plant foods, her, her, uh, her career, uh, or career uh, uh, completion here is in producing these two volumes. And in those, she does uh, mention uh, uh, Salau's 23 times, but acorns are mentioned. Oak is mentioned um, uh, 11 times, and it's usually mentioned as, uh, as uh, something uh, that, uh, that they burn, they burn the oak savannas, but not for the acorns, really for the uh, for the camas to enhance camas. But then when she does talk about acorn use, she's referring to the two sites at sunk the site at Sunken Village we dug for two summers. I sent her all my materials in uh, 2006 and 7 for this 2014 volume. She brings it up that this is a very important resource. So I'm going back and I think maybe. Uh, I think I am, we'll uh, go back to uh, the slides, which probably are much easier to work with. Okay, um, these, these are the, the main sites that we're gonna look at. Uh, and uh, three of them in particular, you're gonna see a lot on Salal from Ozette, but Acorns, and as I mentioned, it's Sunken Village and uh, in Mud Bay or Kukwas here in Olympia. Um, it, this is about three or 400 year old site and it's uh, houses from under a mudslide. 
in back of the the house one the one we really looked at there were 250,000 uh seeds of slough um and then we'll we'll take a look at the the acorn leaching pits down here that are uh pits that are lined with hemlock Hemlock boughs and uh, over a hundred of them were found in our excavations here. And once we did that, we went back to um, Puklas, uh where we were excavating and all of a sudden realized we just weren't seeing the acorns there. But once we dug Sunken Village, we, we knew how to look. And we found almost as much acorn up here in Olympia. Um, these are those books I, I, I tried to point out. Uh, again, the um, literature is uh, uh, beginning to really show up on the ethno, ethnobotany. And, uh, and like I say, 10, ah, this is crazy. All right. Tim mentions a salal every tag here, but nothing Dale? on it. Excuse me, but you're not in slideshow right now. We're, it's like you're in the editing screen. Oh, I see okay. up in the upper left hand corner, there's a says. Does that work? Much better. Now, do you see it? Oh, it's filling the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Full screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a sec. Now, do you see the full screen? No, now you're in edit mode. There's a little thing up there that says use slideshow. It's of those icons in the upper left. It's the rightmost. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna stop this. And uh, uh, let's see. Dale, when you clicked use slideshow, you became you became the the filled the screen, except for a column on one side where you know when one of us spoke, um, we became visible. But really, for the presentation, that was what you wanted to do was click that that option that says use slideshow. Okay. Yeah. I'm going back in. I think. Now do you see the full screen? No, but see where it says use slideshow. Stick right, go right there. No. There, leave it there. Now progress. Oh, well, yeah, awesome. Okay. Sorry. And and they again mention uh, uh, acorns. Finally, in 2014, Nancy Turner does uh, several times. But it's usually uh, when it comes to burning under the oaks, oak uh, savannas or prairies, it's to enhance camas. It has nothing to do with acorns. Uh, even though California tribes, and I'm sure up here, they were burning under the, is this working now? You see it? Yes. Yes. And they're burning under the oak savannas, not just for camas, but to get rid of these uh, pests. This is an uh, acorn weevil, an acute nose. He'll, uh, she will drill into here and drop her eggs off. Another male weevil will come along and fertilize them. And then the, the larva will eat the nut, will ruin the nut. And um, then the larva comes out and pubates and becomes um, one of these uh, weevils. Same thing happens with a cicada. This is a moth. Uh, it it lays its eggs fertilized through the base of the tr standing tree. I mean, the, of the actual um, oak trees. And they, they will also, uh, uh, they will also, uh, they will also ruin the nut. So burning in between seasons will uh, kill these pests and make the acorns protected. So this was again, not noticed by uh, Nancy. Um, so let's look at salal berries and they tend to be on vines uh, with several berries uh, that are usually picked 
uh, um, off the stem as a form of pruning. Nancy talks about how important salal berries are, and let me quote her. On the Northwest coast, salal berries are one of the most important fruit species. These berries were also harvested in enormous numbers, adding up to 100,000 to 200,000 berries per family per year, and millions if one considers an entire community. And there's usually about five families, say like in the Ozette house we excavated, say four families, one in each corner, maybe a fifth one. So you're talking about the million berries that would be collected uh, per year. And they were generally cooked on hot rocks and dried into cakes, uh, some weighing as much, much as uh, 10 to 50 pounds. And this is a good example of drying salal berries. Uh, and they were stored in large pack baskets of 20 liters. We found 60 of these pack baskets in the Ozette house uh, with quantities equivalent to those of Saskatoon berries stored by interior plateau families. In um, another reference that's often cited by Pat Kelly, nutritious uh, composition of selected important Northwest coast plant foods. He says, salal berries were the most abundant fruit available to the coastal Indians. They were consumed in large quantities, larger, larger quantities than any other berry in the coastal Aboriginal diet. When eaten fresh, the berries were usually dipped into ulican grease, and eaten one at a time. Preparation for winter storage involved mashing the berries and then drying the berries into berry cakes. These berry cakes were approximately one foot wide and three foot long and an inch thick. Um, the <clears throat> sites we're gonna look at are coastal and that's where you're gonna find Salal mostly in the oak tends to be in this corridor of I-5 up into Victoria and Vancouver. Um, but first, let's continue the ethnographic look, uh, which was well documented by John Jewett. Now, John was a slave of McQuinna for three years, uh, from 1803 to 1805. Uh, McQuinna was um, insulted by the the captain, Captain Salter, uh, gave him a gaming piece, a shotgun, and it broke. So he, McQuinna brought it back, Chief McQuinna brought it back, and Salter went on and on for some reason, calling him a dumb Indian, a stupid savage, and on and on. And McQuinna knew a lot of English. <laughs> he knew exactly what uh, Salter was doing and was very insulted. And you don't do that to royal people. So, a few days later, they're about to leave. This is the ship, the Boston out of America. And he boarded the ship with his men and he said, and he was being very friendly. And McQuinn said, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of school fish schooling up at the point. You should take your uh, crew up there in your rowing craft and net a bunch of salmon to take with you fresh. So he did, he thought that was a good idea. And when he left, the sh those that crew left the ship uh, McQuinna made the uh, the signal and they killed everybody on the ship and then the poor people going out to get the salmon. Uh, the first ship taken uh, uh, on the uh, northwest coast completely. Uh, here you can see uh, it being brought into the village with great celebration. Jewett was wounded, um, but McQuinna knew he was the blacksmith and so uh, he knew this would be an important people person to keep, and uh, uh, and even you know Jewett himself said in his narrative that uh, what they actually got off this ship were cutlass, pistols, uh, and three thousand muskets, three thousand muskets and fowling pieces. So John was very important to deal with this wealth that McQuinn obtained. Uh, and so he, he said, if you want to live, um, uh, you are going to be my slave. And, and Jewett said, yeah, that's, that'll be fine. Um, but he was wounded and you can see here, uh, the, um, uh, 
a scar on his face later uh, where he was hit, but he, they nursed him back. Uh, fortunately, his dad sent him, he thought he would be better off uh, in the medical uh, field. So he, before he became a blacksmith, sent him to, to academy. So he's one of the few people that knew how to read and write and he kept a daily diary. He ran out of ink and McQuinnan was actually threatening him with death if he kept writing in there. He knew he was being implicated, I think, and uh, used his own blood to write it as best he could, just small entries every day. And that was published in 1807 when he got rescued. But now you're talking about somebody that was uh, uh, a participant observer and cultural anthropologists liked it totally become part of a, um, a community uh, to understand how it works. And, and he definitely became a participant observer uh, uh, involuntarily as a slave. He learned the language completely. He participated a lot in what they were doing. He wanted to know exactly which sailing ships were coming in the area, so he needed to be good at the language. Uh, he also wanted to know what it, what people were, his community was doing. So anyway, and this is only 25 years after the first science expedition, which is James Cook came into the same place in 1778. So it's, it's pretty, pretty much uh, uh, an excellent uh, study on, on what these people were doing. He wasn't an anthropologist, of course, because it wasn't even a field till 100 years later. But um, probably the biggest eye opener for me on this talk <laughs> is how, how he described the use of salalberries. Uh, and uh, he states among the provisions which the Indians procured at Tashish, which was the salmon fishing site up the inlet. They go in the fall to Tashish, uh, I must not admit mentioning a fruit that is very important as forming a great article of their food. This is what is called by them the yama, a species of berry that grows in bunches like currants upon a bush from two to three feet high and is large with a large round and smooth leaf. If you're familiar with salau, it's very leathery leaves. This berry is black and about the size of a pistol shot, but of rather an oblong shape and open at the top like a blue whortleberry. And a whortleberry is an English berry down here that uh, looks like salal, but it, uh, each berry grows on its own stem. The taste is sweet, but a little acrid. I don't know how many of you have eaten, how many of you have eaten salal berries? They aren't a preferred food, but um, they're a little acrid and when first gathered, if you eat great quantities, especially without oil, he says, uh, it's apt to produce colic, colics. To procure it, large companies of women go out on the mountain accompanied by armed men to protect them against the wild beast where they frequently remain for several days. Jewett was not good at fishing. I doubt he had a lot he could do to help that fishing camp, but he did, was armed. Uh, McQuinnah let him keep his pistol and another person that was uh, found later, uh, John Thompson, were the slaves and they slept by the house door. And so McQuinnah kept them armed. It was one way to protect the household is to have people with pistols at the doorway and they weren't about to try to escape. They knew that was pure, you know, instant uh, torturous death. Um, so I bet he went with them uh, and they remained for several days and he probably helped them gather, but kindling a fire at night and sheltering themselves under uh, sheds constructed of bowels. As these uh, parties, they collected great quantities of salal berries. I have known McQuinnis Queen who owned him and her women uh, ret return loaded, bringing with an upwards of 12 bushels. Is this all showing okay? Can you see my, okay. <laughs> in order to preserve it, <clears throat> it is pressed uh, in the bunches between two planks and dried and, and put away in baskets for, uh, for use. 
um, it is always eaten with oil. Of berries of various kinds, such as strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and so forth, uh, there are great quantities in the country of which natives are very fond, gathering them in their seasons and eating them with oil. And this was usually whale, whale oil, I'm sure, for the Nuchana. Um, but the Yama is the only one that they preserve. So he points out this is the one they kept for winter use. This is the one they preserved into those cakes. Fish is, however, their great article of food as almost all, uh, as almost all others, except for Yama, the Yama may be considered as accidental. <laughs> so he's pointing out the great importance of salal berries. He says fish plus salal berries are the main foods, period. And he doesn't even say it's salmon. He just says fish and all else is accidental. Um, here's a picture of uh, how you gather salal berries and they're picked. This whole stem is picked. And uh, when I was working with McCall Youth and others at Hoko, I was always in curious how they didn't take each berry and eat it. They took the whole stem, but that prunes it. That actually increases the, uh, the future uh, uh, growth of the uh, berries. And uh, they'd put them in baskets like this and he measured it as uh, bushels. Um, and now we're gonna do some calculations on what it, what's, Salal berries might uh, provide to you as described by Jewett and others, but they're only about one centimeter in diameter and a half a cubic centimeter. So there was 35,239 cubic centimeters in each bushel, but multiply that by two and you had in each bushel 70,500 berries or uh, times 12 bushels. You had about 850,000 salal berries from that one trip. Uh, Nancy Turner, the ethnobotanist, says that 2,000 dried salal berries uh, are, are, are seen in a litter, liter, a liter, not a litter. Uh, and there's 35.24 liters per bushel times 12 bushels. So it came out about the same, 850,000 salal berries. Um, and then 40,000 dried berries were put into storage baskets uh, in cakes, no doubt. And they're 20 liter storage baskets. Our, liter, our storage baskets at Ozette were about 15 liters. So not as big as what she's talking about, but 12 bushels would create 21 storage baskets. And at Ozette, there were 60 storage baskets. So that's a third of them were probably filled with these candy bars, really, these berry cakes to get your family through the winter with carbohydrates and sugar. Four uh, baskets per family per year were needed. So 12 bushels should support five families. And like I say, it's probably 40 people in this Ozette Longhouse, uh, five nuclear families. So this one trip to get 12 bushels would have probably supported uh, a household through the winter. Nutritional value, <clears throat> is about four calories for each salal berry, uh, a gram of carbohydrates. So if you had 850 salal berries, you're talking about 3 million, uh, about 400,000 calories and 850,000 uh, grams of carbohydrates. A household like Ozette of 40 individuals needed about 1600 calories per day per person from all foods, this is all foods, and about 200 grams of that uh, should be carbohydrates. So 850,000 grams on divided by this 200 grams of carbohydrates equals about 4,229 grams eaten per day by 40 people. That would that amount of berries that we're talking about from 12 bushels would last 106 days. So this 12 bushels would provide these 40 people their carbohydrate needs for about 100 days, which are the low income three months of winter. You're not getting any food probably in the winter time, uh, December, January, February, about that. So that would provide carbohydrate, sugar, 
to maintain health until the spring shoots, like salmon berry shoots are a big thing, uh, would start appearing. And your macaws that I work with are always hungry for, even though they had all the carbohydrates from potatoes and other things they had, they always wanted, and we had to go collect for the elders the spring uh, salmon berry shoots. Uh, enough of that. <laughs> but so let's look at some of the archaeological evidence. And really, the oldest wet site, one of the oldest sites on the northwest coast, is one of them they did a big ethnobotanical study at, which is a 10,000. 700 year old site on the southern uh, uh, end of uh, Haida Gwaii, which is Queen Charlotte Islands at a site called Kilgi Gwaii. I happen to be part of the crew that revisited in 2012. This is me with my squawks and toque knit hat. Um, and uh, it's a wet site. And they found wooden wedges that are 10,700 years old that seem to be set up for probably leather collars here, uh, showing you how long term the success of woodworking through splitting has been on the coast 10,000, you know, almost 11,000 years at least. And they found uh, some spruce root uh, uh, strings uh, made by braiding. Um, and the area was tidal, so we had to work at low tide, but there was a paleo pond here. And, and in that area, um, the macrophora included uh, salmon berry seeds. Now they're very visible compared to salal berry seeds. And they were hunting a lot of bear at this site from the fauna we find the bones. Uh, and this is probably a coprolite of a bear but it's just full of salmon berry seeds. It could be a human coprolite, but uh, that's what you find. And you all of a sudden say, hey, we have the plant foods here from 10,000 years ago. And it was, um, the salal seeds were the third most common uh, seed there. And uh, this was found, the salal seeds were from a hearth area. And that's all they found was salal seeds, not any uh, salmon berry or elderberry, which is more of a spring, early summer berry versus salal, which is more of a fall. Um, anyway, it just certainly shows that we'll see plant foods in these uh, Paleo Indian uh, wet sites from the earliest uh, uh, movement of people in the post glaciated coast with these kinds of wet sites. They're, they're, they're certainly, uh, they're certainly, um, certainly gonna be found from, from those periods. Uh, okay, let's see. Now, now we'll look at uh, Salal berries more from Moses that archeologically, let's look at the archeological, uh, continue looking at the archeological evidence at Hoko, 3,000 years ago, we found salal berries that we analyzed out of coprolites, human coprolites. Um, and 20% uh, of those in the feces uh, were uh, burnt. So they were processed. So these are probably human coprolites and burnt salal means they were, you know, in part dried and, and, and um, then at Ozette, um, they, uh, as explained by Nancy Turner, uh, the remains of food found at this site and 300 years ago in these longhouses included two hazelnuts, hardly any hazelnut. And we find a lot down in uh, Puget Sound in the Mud Bay site. Um, and almost 90,000 red elderberry seeds. Everybody eats these, right? A lot of these are really still not uh, preferred by non-Indians, but these are eaten fresh uh, today by Macaw. So 90,000 uh, red elderberry seeds were found uh, mixed, mixed with these uh, salmon berry seeds uh, and probably to increase the palatability. If you've eaten elderberries, they're pretty bitter. Anybody here eat elderberry? Just off the branch besides David? Anyway, and then they found these 250,000 salal berry seeds. 
um, and realize uh, there is only one seed per berry on an elderberry, but there's about 50 seeds on a uh, salmon berry. And as I mentioned, I'm counting over a hundred seeds, minute seeds in the, each of these salal berries. So, I mean, it's kind of what we call minimum number of individuals. Those 90,000 Ozette elderberries that are mixed with salmon berries are uh, about 90,000 berries. But salmon berries, if there's 50 seeds per berry, 100,000 seeds really means 2,000 berries. So it's a lot of berries, but it's not. And that's always mixed with elderberry. So Lyle berries are never found mixed with anything, uh, but there's 100 seeds per berry. So when we, we get uh, excited about 250,000 seeds analyzed, you have to divide it by 100 to see how many berries. And really there's uh, still some berries, but 20, 2,500 berries. Um, Ozette, of course, is uh, uh, <clears throat> where several houses were covered by mudside. We only excavated this part of this reconstructed village where they're bringing in whale. Uh, and it was behind this house, those 250,000 uh, slowberry seeds were found in great concentrations. That's why you could see them. I'm sure that's why they 100% they sampled that. But this is house one and it was back here. Here's house one, of course, mashed by the mudslide. Uh, and those berry seeds were found in four squares in this area and another square over here in these plank houses. Um, so this shows you the house that we really analyzed, but you can see four contigu contiguous seed squares with these 201 up other square that makes up this 250,000 uh, Salal berry seeds. Um, and he never found any Salal berry seeds in the house floor, hardly. You know, one house he found, I think, uh, two Salal seeds, which are minute, and another house, maybe six. Um, so, he said, well, they're out here behind the house in the shell midden uh, and points out the reason for this is straight forward. The Macaw historically made sun-dried berry cakes of mashed salal berries and to lesser extent, huckleberries. <clears throat> At least the drying and probably the mashing portion of the process would have been conducted outside the house back here. The mashing stage of the cake manufacturing uh, procedure is most likely to produce spillage. So this is considered spillage. There might only be in minimum number of individual 2,500 berries, but that's a lot of spillage too. Uh, any spillage of the dried cakes in the house would be relatively easy to clean up and would thus leave little evidence in the house midden. Um, yeah, the house floors were very well kept clean. Uh, I, I still think they just didn't see them because we weren't we able to recover them except in 100% samples, but they're very concentrated here. Um, so 2,500 uh, Salal berries are probably those that aren't good that are being sorted off before they put together the cake. So uh, they're probably a equivalent to what we were seeing talked about at, uh, by John Jew at, uh, up at uh, Uquan. And so there are probably quite abundant amount of berries being made and in, mashed into uh, these cakes and a certain amount of throwing away or spillage. Um, um, and these are the 60 uh, storage baskets I uh, analyzed. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, according to Jewett uh, calculations, that about 20 of these might have held the berry cakes. Uh, 2,500 berry berries as seen in the spillage would only fill about a tenth of one of these baskets. These are the fish, the foods, fish storage baskets are called. 
but it's for dried salmon, it's for dried shellfish, and, and no doubt these you know, very important berry cakes uh, for carbohydrates and sh sugars. Um, so even though there isn't really a lot of berries found behind that house, they were probably producing an awful lot of uh, berry cakes uh, to get them through the winter. So it still gives us a pretty good perspective of how important salal berries must have been. Well, uh, let's go to acorns. Uh, and these are Gary oak, they're called, or white oak. Uh, and uh, um, they're not referenced, like I say in that first book, keeping it living. But Erna Gunther, uh, who wrote one of the very first extensive ethnobotanies in 1945, she does talk about oak uh, and uh, use of acorns. She says, as food, the Nisqually, the Chehalis, the Cowlitz, the Squaxin, who live in the section where oak trees are most numerous, use the acorns as food. Uh, you know, but in the true evergreen forest areas, the, uh, that is an unknown dish, meaning the West Coast. You just aren't going to have oak out uh, where they're using really salal to make sure they get their carbohydrates. Um, the Chehalis roast acorns in the fire. Acorns are stored in baskets of young maple bark and buried in the mud in, of a slough all winter. Uh, as a leaching process. In the spring, when they are taken out to eat, they look as though they are spoilt, but they are delicious. The callets bury acorns in the mud to leach them. The squawks and roast them on hot rocks. The uh, lala meet the acorn as a nut without preparation. And this is when I bring in Dave Munsell, who, because she does mention this quality, but she does not say how they used acorns. David, do you want to? Yes. Uh, some years ago, like 1967, I was doing an archaeological survey. I was doing an archaeological survey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we hear you fine. Thanks, David. I was doing an archaeological survey in the Nisqually Delta, associated with the Interstate Five uh, right away, and at that time, I worked with a main woman by the name of Ruby McAllister who owned the property on the north end of what is now the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge. And she had a prehistoric site on her property, an all the west ethno-historic. But down on the flats, she had two pits. There were acorn pits that she, her, her family told her about. Um, her father was a very important uh, person there with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or whoever, and um, that's how she acquired her section of ground on that area. But they had two acorn pits about three feet deep and about oh, 60 centimeters in diameter. And that, that was the only reference she, she knew about that she had ever heard of. And that was on her property. Yeah. I was, yeah. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking to a, uh, uh, Wenatchee Indian who used to fish on the uh, Salau, uh, uh, yeah, in the Salau area. Uh, what am I thinking? And the Lower Columbia, Salado Falls. And as a young person, they used to eat uh, acorn soup made down there. He didn't know how they were processed at all, just ate the soup. Yeah, the, um, we, we, like I say, we found a lot of acorn in Kukwas. So their cultural heritage program went around and talked to a lot of Nisqualis and others and nobody knew a thing about it. So this observation by David is actually very important as far as Nisqually. Uh, One of the things that I find interesting is I've worked in the Eastern part of the United States where you have a lot of netting stones or in uh -huh. California where you have large be, uh, bedrock mortars and they'll have small dimples in them where you put the net to crack it. And acorn using people in Northern California use netting rocks. I have yet to see a netting rock anywhere in Western Washington or in Washington at all. Mm -hmm. 
We certainly see ground grinding stones, it seems like in Locarno Beach time periods, and maybe we'll talk. Right. About maybe there were much more use of uh, acorns uh, in earlier periods in the, uh, uh, this corridor up north in the central northwest coast. But thank, thank you, David. Right, no problem. Um, so, Sunka Village is, is uh, uh, mentioned by Nancy Turner uh, in her vote to and because we found over 100 acorn leaching pits. Uh, and it's the largest acorn leaching pit site uh, on the entire uh, west coast of North America, even in California and uh, Oregon, as David mentioned, much more use and known use of acorn, but uh, um, not the site like we found at Sunken Village. Um, and it certainly reflects the importance of, it, of acorns at the, in the central coast area. Uh, but not to fully uh, repeat what uh, Beth Matthews did to, to look at this site in our final report, which is available on academia.edu. We have the full report there under my page there. But these are the 100 acorn leaching plates that were mapped along the slough here. These are dolphins for tying up uh, log rafts. Uh, Oftentimes these pits had stakes put near them so that uh, after the silting in, after they've been leaching through the uh, winter and into the spring, you could find the pit again. Uh, they're basically leached by water aquifers that are coming through the ground from behind the natural levee. And uh, it moves to the ground, we measured it at five gallons per hour. So there's a fair amount of water washing only in this 125 meters uh, beach. Uh, so no pits down here where water isn't moving through the ground, only along this premier spot, which was no doubt owned by a big family of Chinook and people. Um, and it drops off its oxygen. The water drops its oxygen uh, and, and decay organisms like bacteria and fungus cannot operate. So the wooden fiber in these pits are well preserved. Uh, we measured that there's two parts per million of oxygen in the water in, in this aquifer area. And usually your tap water has uh, as much as 10 or more parts per million of uh, oxygen. Um, and here's a pit here. Uh, again, uh, you can see the hemlock boughs coming out and and usually lots of uh, acorns laying around these pits. But we, we photographed and uh, mapped each of these 114 pits uh, and did experiments with them too. But this shows you how the water goes through the acorns. Uh, they're probably put into these pits uh, alive uh, when they're gathered, uh, you know, fresh and, and they germinate. So that cracks them open a little and then they drown. And so therefore the cracked acorns can leach out and become sweet uh, over the winter. And, uh, and, and the ones that didn't crack are probably sorted out. That's why we find a lot around the pit because these would spoil your soup. They would not be leached out and the tannic acid would still be pretty bitter. Here's what we did. Tyler Graham, uh, our student, did an experiment. He, he used an aquarium, lined it with hemlock boughs. We ran water from this side through the bear, the bear, the nuts, and up and out through this side. And we did that for uh, four months. Uh, and they were done. They again looked a little spoiled, but. Uh, if you were at the Penmos meeting where right after this experiment, you probably uh, had the opportunity <laughs> voluntarily to eat some of these that were leached for four months in this aquarium uh, setup. Um, they're still they're still eaten today by the Oregon tribes as a ceremony for soup. Once they're uh, once they're sweet, you can make a, a flower if you want, or you can you know, make it into a soup. And then uh, it's still quite uh, used there. 
Um, and uh, anyway, uh, and they have to do the same thing. Uh, some, some, some people put them into bags in their toilet tank for months and that's clean water. Well, every time you flush, clean water goes through and those uh, acorns become, uh, uh, the acid comes out of them and they, they can be used in, uh, in soup. <laughs> Somebody sneezed. Um, and um, so anyway, um, uh, these uh, pits were cross-sectioned in some cases. And then Beth Matthews was able to say, well, this kind of volume could hold 26,000 acorns and that, or 2,500 ac 25, acorns. And that's time 100. That's where we get the you could process to 2,500,000 acorns in a season, uh, which again would be the fall when the oak drops. And some of you have acorn trees, they certainly grow around here uh, and uh, till April, and then you get them out. Uh, we did not find, this was called Sunken Village, but there was no village here. You know, the village, the houses in uh, like Cathapotal, like the houses in the Chinook area, have, Lots of pits in the floor. Well, these were not in floors of houses. On the natural levee, we did find a shelter. There was a shelter up on top. And we think that's a, a place for sentries to protect this pit over those three or four months of winter because uh, it's very valuable. And uh, so you can imagine uh, young people might stay there uh, and you know, we're going to protect these from people, but uh, other uh, predators, and particularly raccoons, would be a serious problem for those acorn pits. Uh, we see lots of projectile points down, arrowheads down in the pit area, and they're probably being shot from the sentry to convince raccoons this is not a good idea. Uh, we certainly saw them while we were digging there. We see the tracks. Uh, Lots of stories the Chinook um, people have about raccoon trying to convince his grandmother to um, let him go down and, and eat out of her leaching pit, her acorn pit. And eventually he convinces her that he could go have some. So he goes down, but he eats them all. He eats them all out of the pit in this story. And then he poops in it. He fills it with raccoon pellets and, and uh, so in the spring, she goes down and to get her acorns and uh, yuck, you know, their raccoon poop. He's totally ostracized in the community at that point, has to leave and is eventually killed. So it wasn't a good idea. But these stories are telling you how serious uh, you have to protect these uh, acorn leaching pits. Um, as mentioned, when we went in, to the sunken village, we we certainly started learning about acorns. When we went back to Mud Bay, because we were still excavating there, we realized we weren't. Um, there were plenty of uh, acorns at Mud Bay, as much almost as that sunken village. Um, and these were in these uh, waterlogged midden areas uh, and lots of other macroflora. But after the um, work at Mud Bay, you know, we had a true case of uh, at Mud Bay, I mean, at Sunken Bay, excuse me, we had a true case where you don't see the things because you don't know how to look. We didn't know how to look for acorns. We had no idea what they really looked like till we dug for two summers at Sunken Village and the same crews are back at Mud Bay and they're saying, hey, these things are all over the place. You know, we thought it was mostly hazelnuts was the carbohydrate there, but, uh, and we thought the acorn pieces were actually scales out of dug fir cones. So we were not seeing, we were not seeing, but after that experience, we certainly knew how to look and we, we could see that uh, acorns were seven times as common as uh, hazelnut remains uh, and a very important crop there. Like we said with uh, what David was saying and Jamie may have found, we, um, 
didn't find any pits there. There's no reason there shouldn't be because uh, again, waters, aquifers are going through the ground at a very rapid rate. You just see water pouring out of these uh, water wet site areas of the shell midden. Um, okay, let's look at distribution. This is certainly where we know Gary Oaks are today. Uh, these are ethnographic uh, accounts. These are archaeological sites, Sunken Village and Mud Bay at Olympia. Um, and the Salau is really more of a, a forested area, outer coast area uh, system. We know that there was a period uh, uh, roughly between 8,000 and 3,000 years ago when it was warmer and drier than present. Uh, oh, I should point out now that this is Victoria. And in 1800, these were the oak groves. Uh, the red dots are what they're like in 1997. They're just very much reduced. Uh, oak groves used to be much more common throughout this area. Really the best place for oak groves today is a refugium called Fort Lewis. Fort, uh, um, Lewis is a no man's land. Nobody's going in there without permission. And oaks do very well. Uh, if you go along I-5, you'll see the, the barriers along the, the wall burials along the uh, uh, freeway have oak leaves in designs in the cement. And that's because there's all this oak uh, in Fort Lewis. Um, when I was at Sunken Village, I was talking to the farmer that owned the site <clears throat> at his house. And, and I brought up, I said, um, I said, uh, did you notice a lot more oak trees when you first moved into this area? Because there are some oak trees across the levee from Mud Bay today, but very few. He says, oh yeah, yeah, they were all over the hillside over there. And I said, well, we're, what happened to them? What happened to them? And he, he pointed at his, his floor. He, he said, I milled it myself. <laughs> <laughs> So that's your oak oak floor, uh, how we used to get it. Uh, it's right in the, in the neighborhood around here. Um, but eight to 3,000 years ago, it was much warmer and drier. And it's we use terms like altothermal, hypsothermal, and climatic optimum, uh, referring to this eight to 3,000 year old warmer period. Uh, kind of obsolete terms now, but it's clear it was uh, warmer. And, um, and, and uh, so oak was probably, oak trees were probably in Pat Patrick uh, Pringle is with us. He, he would know that probably this was a much more dense oak savanna area, oak prairies along here. They still wouldn't be out on the coast where it's a bit too wet. Uh, and that, that's where you would still need Salau. Uh, but you can bat the oak extended up further north on inside of Vancouver Island and down in Victoria and on up in the delta here. And maybe at levels that we see acorns used in California were common uh, eight to 3,000 years ago in our area. Periods called the old Cordillera and the old Cot. Uh, and the St. Mungo and maybe even, and that's where I'm saying we've seen grinding stones in the uh, Locarno Beach, which could be something that you would need to, to work on acorns, uh, but they disappeared later. <clears throat> um, and so anyway, this court, this is the only place so far, but you can bet these wet sites probably have acorns, they just weren't able to see them. They just, again, if you don't know how to look, you don't know what, how to see them. And uh, so we should maybe return to some of these collections if they collected uh, the macro flora to see for, look for acorns. Uh, and, uh, and then again, on the coast throughout that time period and 10,000 years ago, Salal would have been your food, not, not uh, uh, hazelnuts or uh, acorns. Um, and uh, we get to enhancing uh, salal and acorn. Salals probably were pruned and, uh, uh, and 
And we can certainly say that uh, burning would enhance your acorn uh, harvest, even though Nancy doesn't mention that. She says it's for camas enhancement. It's, it would get rid of the uh, these uh, 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 pests, really, for acorns anyway. <laughs> the acorn weevil that would ruin the, the, the nut and create this cycle. But if you burn it in the spring, the leaf mat, it won't harm the oak trees, but it sure will do in these pubating uh, or, uh, pests like the cacadia here, the filbert worm does the same thing in its cycle. But if you burn them and kill them, that would enhance the, the quality of your acorn production. Uh, so that's, that's certainly going on, uh, certainly going on in California by the tribes. Um, if you wanted to, Really, you know, they're they're always talking about are these uh, domesticated or some of these plants domesticated or cultivated? They're definitely protected, like this. Uh, yeah, no problem. But uh, if you want to talk about uh, full blown domestication in this part of the Northwest Coast, one only has to look at animals uh, and not <coughs> plants from the archeological and ethnographic record, the breed of hair dog we were talking about before we started is, uh, is uh, Kepra separate from, uh, uh, and in separate from the, the village dog in islands and other places and uh, bred for its hair quality, you know, some certainly genetic engineering and that's the wool dog. Uh, this is often called uh, animal husbandry when referring uh, to complex agricultural societies, a term that is patronizing. I mean, it should, instead of husbandry, probably should be wifery, because it probably represented the wealth, how many dogs you had, uh, the wealth you had to make the actual currency, the blankets that were the main uh, uh, va uh, valued currency on the coast and still is. Uh, you certainly see spinners for a thousand years uh, in, in sites along the coast. These true looms are much more complex than hanging looms like chokeout blankets were made on. These are certainly found in wet sites in a couple of cases. And the, the hair dog for over a thousand years seems separate uh, from the uh, village dog. This is a village dog from OZ and a hair dog. And here's the true looms uh, from under a bench, bench platform at Ozette and the wooden spinners, almost all of them were wooden. And then the blanket we were talking about that has hair and bark and uh, other fibers that uh, Tim was talking about. Um, so, you know, this, this is, complex hunting, fishing, and gathering societies that are doing just genetic engineering and making a hair quality and picking those puppies that I'm sure had the quality uh, to keep separate. Uh, uh, and the only other place in the whole America are the, again, back where you consider husbandry more common, were the uh, uh, civilizations of the uh, Inca or 15 million people and a certain agriculturalist and they 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 bred the alpaca for its hair quality. Well, the Inca were, and they had similar wool gathering to macaw up here. Oh, wow, interesting. Was that again? Could you repeat that? But yeah, this is this is what you tend to think of as for domesticating, and certainly going on in our area uh, of the. Uh, Salish Sea, anyway. Uh, and this is a dog I took a picture of in uh, Nia Bay. It uh, wasn't owned. <laughs> it was living off of fish off the beach, but and very shy. But a classic hair on that one. But I, I took pictures of maybe two dozen of these, uh, what I'd consider hair dogs up there in the 70s and 80s. Uh, well, we better conclude this, um, but I hope, uh, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of things need to be better explored, but uh, I, I'd certainly 
claim that similar knowledge and practices of tending salal patches uh, in Oregon White and Gary Oak uh, were critically important and deeply rooted in the history of this area. Uh, we certainly have five wet sites where we really see signs of either salal or uh, and other berries, but salal being so important and, and uh, acorns. Uh, and even some that are, you know, salal seeds from, from uh, a hearth that's 10,700 years old in this uh, waterlogged site of uh, Tilde Way. Uh, therefore, these sites are important uh, to identify as part of the ancient diets, to find out the ancient diets that might otherwise be underrepresented or completely absent. You're really not going to see these in shellman sites usually. Um, and mostly what we look at are the fauna of uh, fish, you know, bones and shellfish, whereas plant foods would have a, a big value, important value for health. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of wet sites. Like I say, only about 16 have been explored to any extent on the coast. So we really, <clears throat> and only five of them have eth ethnobotanical uh, studies, uh, the five I showed. So um, I hope in the coming future, it'll be better revealed through expanded wet site exploration on the Northwest coast of North America. Uh, it, it's an area that isn't emphasized, not part of the learning tradition or field work uh, on the coast, but it really should be much more of that. So thank you. Let me stop this. Thanks for putting up with uh, trying to get this thing uh, under control. Is Matt here yet? I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, uh, certainly time for, for some questions. Uh, okay. Well, I, I'm watching something on my um, computer, can I call you back in maybe half an hour or so? Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. Is that Anita? No. Yeah. Anita, um, we recorded this. I finally got the recording going. So we'll, we'll also have this talk available for you later. Any other comments or questions on this? Dale, the San Juans have a, used to have a lot of work, uh, oak trees on it. Uh -huh. The San, San Juan Islands had a lot of uh, oak trees. And on my property there in, on Lopez Island, we had uh -huh. lots of Salau too. You yeah. had both of those things available. Right. Yeah, Salau certainly found. Uh, you know, where oak trees are, uh, but it's usually in a different environment on the right. prairies, but up uh, in the forested areas in a pretty rigorous berry, but it certainly was important. I think we don't pay attention to all the information that John Jewett's able to provide <laughs> as a slave for two and a half years with McQuinna. <laughs> uh, he really had to know the culture and uh, to survive and the language. <clears throat> Dale, this is Jamie. I, um, Hi, Jamie. My question uh, was, well, first of all, I had a question, but then you brought up John Jewett again. And I remember you had us reading his book in class. And so um, I, I remember that and I still have my copy of it. I'm gonna have to go back and look at it now. But, yeah, you'll um, find I, Yeah, that's Hillary Stewart's version of, uh, a well-illustrated version of Jewett's adventures. Well, go ahead. Yeah. And then my questions were that it sounded like now you've said you found uh, lots of acorns here at the Mud Bay site, but then was it David said that the Nisqually people didn't know or use um, a lot with acorns. Oh, and so tell me more about that. And because I know that um, oak trees are very common in the Yelm Prairie and that the people used to burn the prairie for the camas and also um, um, the other nut, hazelnuts. And so all of these 
materials or plant materials you're talking about all grow in Thurston County. So, so I wanted to know more about what you were saying about the Nisqually people because they have the acre, they have the oak trees. Yeah, David, did you want to add anything? I mean, Jimmy, like I said, uh, Ruby McAllister, who was part uh, the Squally, they had them, like I said, they had uh, leaching pits on her property. And she's right there in the, in the Squally Delta, which is an ideal place for leaching. But I don't know, just the two of them that she recognized yeah. and talked about. And, I, and I've never seen them anywhere else there. But yes, you're right. There's a lot of oak trees down there. Yeah, we we talked to Maisel. Uh, oh, what's her last name? Maisel was Billy Frank's sister, and uh, she had no recollection of anybody talking about using acorns. Uh, and uh, so, what David saw there was uh, just probably the last knowledge that is 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 uh, out there about that. Um, and like I say, the ethnobotanies that were written in the uh, 2005 don't mention it. There's just nothing. Amy Nern and Gunther did, and that's worth recognizing. And she talks about Nisqually, but doesn't, she just says Nisqually. She doesn't say this is what the Nisqually did with acorns like she did with the, uh, the other communities she uh, mentioned. Other questions? Well, I, is uh, Pat still with us? Yeah, Pat, do you, do you have any thoughts about that earlier uh, warmer, drier period? Yeah, I, I can't remember. I, I knew it was really warmer about 7,000 years ago. I, and then we had um, one of these neoglacial uh, period starting, I think, around 28 or 2900 years ago, sort of a beginning of a mini ice age. And then, of course, the real, the, the most recent and more noteworthy little ice age of the 1300 or so to 1850. So now, yeah, I think it was warmer then because, uh, among other things, we were more uh, toward the, the optimum radiation in the Milankovitch cycle, right about that time, around seven or 8,000 years ago. So, you know, we're slowly, slowly approaching the next ice age, although uh, humans seem to be doing their best to keep it as warm as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So the environment would be quite different, probably. I mean, uh, certainly the savannas and prairies would be, you know, like the Mima Mount area. I mean, they'd be much more probably. Extensive. And uh, Linda, one more thing I should add is that Linda Brubaker. Uh, who retired from the forestry department at the University of Washington did a, she and others have done studies that showed that, uh, and I, th this is just going by my memory, so I can't, I, I can't be sure, but I think uh, Douglas fir shows up in the Puget Lowland about 6,000 years ago uh, as a more, more abundant species. So that would correspond with the cooler, with the cooler times also. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, when, when we do this exhibit at uh, Squawkson of these mammoth bones, uh, uh, Pat's offered to do a community talk. So we'll let everybody at Penwell know that too about the, some of the floods that came down uh, from uh, areas along the Northern Chehalis drainage that would have impacted people, you know, glacial dams that break, uh, things like that. We're also gonna have Scott Williams uh, help with uh, uh, stone tool making, uh, when napping at the Squaxin Center. So it'll be open to all of us. And uh, and probably Dan Mia will do Adelels. So um, other other comments about <clears throat> yeah, that? I guess when I first wrote this paper, I didn't realize, I think about the minimum number of individuals, how how those salal berries have so many berries that once you do, uh, you know, you recognize that two and a half million berries, uh, or 20, excuse me, 250, a quarter of a million berries at Ozette really doesn't only represents 2,500 berries. 
<laughs> but it's spillage. Uh, but it was interesting to to or somebody to point that out that you know you're not talking about quarter of a million berries. You're talking about really 2,500 berries represented in what they call minimum number of individuals by what's uh, what's the counts. Dale, instead of spillage, what do you think of the, about that being an outhouse? Where and those, is that? And those are all fecal uh, seeds. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm always, uh, you know, it's like a rosette. We found them in human coprolites. Exactly. And you'll find them in great numbers. But those are off intertidal. And they did not tend to just go in the back of the house. They would go in the intertidal uh as a way to flush and so i don't i really doubt that the fact that you found it in those four squares is because he used it as an outhouse just doesn't add up with the ethnography they 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 tended to use the inner title and be very clean about it um which makes sense and that's what we actually were finding those copper lights in the uh, river you know offshore bank at hoko uh, and they appear to be human and 20 percent of the salaberries are burnt which probably you know wolves or coyotes or dogs wouldn't well dogs would be eating you know berries from human and so would other animals but uh so they may not be well there's other reasons to believe they're human but uh they may not be human but i you know they tend to be the fact that they have burnts allow seeds in those copper lice seems to mean human. Up in the Skagit one time, I found concentrations of blackberry seeds, uh -huh. like about units, like about a pound of blackberry seeds at a time in archaeological sites. Uh -huh. and, and I don't know what, I don't, I don't think they were copper lights, they were more like a basket full of Blackberries. Yeah. Oh. I find it interesting that uh, Jewett points out that the only one preserved, uh, which is probably not totally the case, but the only one that they made into cakes was Salal. Um, but some of those other uh, berries are uh, maybe not uh, uh, really good for drying, like salmon berries or, uh, or um, you know, elderberries, eh? <clears throat> but anyway, I think elderberries, if you mix them with oils, would, would last pretty well, and maybe salmon berries too. The, the uh, Salal, you know, they start picking those in June and July, traditionally, and they can be picked up as late as August, dried on the bushes. Yeah, I mean, it, they tend to be really good, uh, more in the August time period, August, September, yeah. out at Hoko. And there and there were certain places uh, that Macaws, who I worked with, knew of that were very concentrated in terms of Salau production, Salau bushes. But a lot of those have become like San Juan Vista. They were developed and, and destroyed in development. Uh, uh, but they were probably patches like McQuinn's wife or queen who, where they were owned and nobody messed with them unless uh, they were related or so, because that'd be so important to that part of their diet. So anyway, uh, hi, Mike. Mike Doherty's here. Can you hear me? Anyway, Mike's from uh, uh, Port Angeles. But he works a lot with the Squim Mastodon uh, project. Hi, Dale. Thanks to all you guys for building up this community of archaeology. I, sh I should talk to you about the Squim Mastodon. We might need to see if we can get a Mastodon bone for an a exhibit we're doing at the Squaxin Museum, Squaxin Tribe Museum. Do you have a lot in storage? And you, I, I, I don't, you're are you on the board with the with the uh, Squim Art Museum? Uh, no, <clears throat> you know I know the most of the board members and stuff, but Claire is still alive and well and a great speaker. If you wanted to talk to Manny's 
surviving okay. spouse. Yeah. She's remarried, but boy, she's got uh, a lot of fire in her lap to give a good talk. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have her phone number? I called and I just didn't, uh, for some reason, it was a, the wrong number. If you could uh, I'll email you. To me. Okay. Well, anything else? We. Okay, well, uh, thank, thanks for uh, putting up with a lot of technical issues. Usually our uh, uh, Matt Barkley is right there to help, but it seemed to slowly sort out. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate it. So uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, when Kelly gives her talk. I'm on those submerged uh, fish traps, and I'll try to arrange a speaker to talk about those cold Clovis uh, uh, dwellings that they're finding in a site in Wyoming. There's now three of them uh, at, at a place where I guess I guess a mammoth would uh, take care of your food supply for uh, for about uh, a month is what they're estimating. So you would want to stay around uh, and process that. Well, thanks, Jamie and others. Uh, anything else? Thank you very much, Dale. What's that? Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, thank you, David, for uh, that, and uh, Kim from uh, uh, near Richland there. <laughs> yeah, you bet. That was good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank you, and uh, we will. Uh, oh, and then Grace Shepherd is a new member. Thanks, Grace. Hope you and like everybody it. have a good holiday. <laughs> oh, yeah, holiday definitely. Everyone. And everybody stay healthy. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think we're getting getting there. Um and uh uh it's it's slow but sure, it's still a problem. So stay healthy. We'll see you soon then. <laughs> Season's greetings. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. I like your uh comments about Buffalo.